Centuries ago, Spanish sailors made this same voyage in small sailing ships blown westward by friendly trade winds and protected bajo la gracia de Dios, by the grace of God. And when the flocks of birds appeared, they knew their destination was very near. Not just any destination in the New World, but the jewel of Spain's colonial ports, un puerto muy rico, a very rich port. Every time I see the great fort at the head of the harbor, I know I'm home. There's no doubt that much has changed since the days of the old Spanish galleons, but great ships the world over are still drawn to this magnificent harbor and my precious island. The memory of Christopher Columbus remains a monumental presence here and throughout Puerto Rico. When Columbus claimed the island for Spain on his second voyage to the New World in 1493, he claimed it for the Church of Rome as well. In recent years, other Christian churches have also attracted followers in this mostly Catholic country. After church on Sunday morning, the vast field behind El Morro is filled with children taking full advantage of the continuous trade wind breezes. If you can't fly a kite here, then you just can't fly a kite. The modern fountain of our roots reminds us that we are really three people blended into one. Una grande mezcla. First, the Taino Indians who populated the island for thousands of years before Columbus arrived, then the West Africans who were forced to labor as slaves for centuries on the vast sugar, tobacco, and coffee plantations, and the Spanish who ruled the island until it finally gained a measure of its independence. Three proud people in one.
The old town, Viejo San Juan, remains a walled, old world city with as much charm and friendly warmth as a visitor can possibly imagine. No place touches the hearts of Puerto Ricanos quite like the old town. And when I hear the strains of Mi Viejo San Juan, I know I'm home. In addition to its easy and pleasing atmosphere, its cobblestoned, tree-lined streets, the old town presents Spanish colonial architecture in its purest form, sometimes with exquisite Moorish touches. On a peaceful afternoon, it's as though these streets begin to sing sweetly in your ear. But, as with any city in the world, it is the people who give the place its true flavor. And old San Juan is as zestful and savory as a city can get. political debate here is whether Puerto Rico should choose to become the 51st state of the Union or become completely independent of the U.S. Most people now seem content to remain a Commonwealth of the United States. As such, Puerto Rico is American soil and all Puerto Ricans are American citizens. The very design of the Capitol building reflects the powerful American influence. Viejo San Juan is actually a tiny island attached to the larger island by bridges. It is only a small part of a sprawling modern city. Various districts comprise Greater San Juan. Given the sheer volume of traffic in the most populous city in the Caribbean, it's never easy getting from here to anywhere. In newly developed Atorre, corporate buildings are beginning to give the city the look of many other financial centers in the modern world. Some like to call it progress.
Ah, but tall buildings, too many cars and shopping malls also create a need for an escape to some place, any place green and quiet. And San Juan has managed to preserve quite a bit of it. The Spanish influence is still strong enough to make soccer, or football, as we like to call it, an important and healthy sport for kids. But it is American baseball that is the true sporting passion throughout the island. Wherever you travel on the island, you will always find a baseball field and boys trying to become the next Orlando Cepeda or Roberto Clemente. The great Clemente is venerated almost like a saint. He died on New Year's Eve of 1972 when the cargo plane he had loaded with humanitarian aid for Nicaraguan earthquake victims crashed right off Isla Verde. Roberto Clemente was only 38. Once a year, just when the tropical day begins to cool, the Teodoro Moscoso Bridge is closed to traffic and draped in colorful Puerto Rican and American bunting. The toll plaza is filled to overflowing with 11,000 runners. This is the famous San Juan 10K race, whose slogan is, run it or walk it, but don't miss it. Thing about races. Somehow horses never come to watch people run. Many of San Juan's best beaches are here in the Condado, the district of glamorous hotel resorts, flashy casinos, and fine restaurants. The beaches in Puerto Rico are world famous and always open to the public. People are drawn to whatever beach setting suits them, and everyone manages to be cooled equally by the soft winds. Puerto Ricanos far from home often say, the sweet breeze, like an island kiss, is the thing they miss the most.
The sprawling city ends abruptly, not because it really wants to. The marshland east of Greater San Juan makes tall construction here almost impossible. For an island barely 35 miles wide and 100 miles long, there is more natural diversity than anyone would believe possible, and much more sheer beauty than most places have a right to. This is the only rainforest in the U.S. National Forest System and a natural treasure. This was a sacred place for the Taino Indians who lived here countless centuries ago. Its name, El Yunque, is the Taino word for happy spirit. Here is where moments of profound contentment is still possible. Wild orchids, hibiscus, and bougainvillea grow in rich profusion. Here, bird calls fill the air. This is where the rare and endangered Puerto Rican green parrot finds protection. Here also, as evening falls, millions of tiny coquis, our beloved frogs, begin to chirp their familiar island call. A rainforest legend goes like this. Long before the conquistadores arrived in Borinquen, the island's Taino name, an Indian prince named Coqui fell in love with the goddess in the forest. A jealous god spirited Coqui away, leaving the goddess in sorrow. And now, the small frogs, it is said, lovingly and longingly echo his name. A trek to the summit of El Yunque is difficult, but from there, you can see the island as the Taino saw it. And you are sure to sense, for a moment, something eternal. At Fajardo, the lighthouse is still a sentinel at the northeast corner of the island. The nature preserve that surrounds it is like a Scottish moor. However, this is Puerto Rico. So the sea is cobalt blue and the sunlight streams continuously. On an east side cliff, Fajardo resorts are considered a suburb of paradise for vacationers, most especially for sailors and divers. The tramway takes visitors down to the sea and awaiting boats for trips out to Las Cordilleras, the small offshore islands, and to much larger Culebra and Vieques as well. It's not surprising that the largest marina on the island, and probably in the entire Caribbean, is here. 1,100 boats find anchorage in this sheltered cove.
In some places on the East Coast, the distinction between a boat and a home begins to blur. In other places, it looks as though the glamour of the French Riviera has come to Puerto Rico. But here on our tropical beaches, the seashore belongs to everyone. This is a very strange place, reminiscent of a Hollywood science fiction movie. Formerly, it is Cayo Santiago, but everyone here calls it Monkey Island, La Isla de los Monos. In the late 1930s, a team of university scientists thought this would be an ideal place to do research on rhesus monkeys for human medical purposes. 500 of them were let loose in the small island. Now, the cries of 1,200 of the creatures echo eerily through the trees. Only authorized personnel are actually permitted to visit the island. As with all four corners of Puerto Rico, the southeastern tip is marked by yet another lighthouse. off the southern coast over the flat farmland below the mountain chain known as the Cordillera Central are the small farms and grazing land of the Jibaros, family farmers whose devotion to the land is legendary. This too was my proud family background. In the not too distant colonial past, this land was primarily sugar plantations run by slaves taken against their will from their villages in West Africa. There's more than a little shame in this period of the island's history. The plantation owner's hacienda may have once occupied this site. These days, as part of the island's economic resurgence, the lands of many former plantations have given way to more large-scale farming than the island has ever known before. And that's a good thing. The more we can produce for ourselves, the better.
This town was built by sugarcane in its heyday, one of the wealthiest in Puerto Rico. But it was also called the city of witches because the slaves practiced santeria, a blending of their magical West African beliefs with Catholicism. Even now, craftsmen carve small idols, santos, that are said to have mysterious spiritual powers. The Chamber of Commerce really prefers that the town be known as the cleanest city in all of Puerto Rico. North of Guayama, the foothills of the Cordillera Central make for a pretty tough climb. The fact that so many rain clouds stay on the northern slopes of the mountain means that the land south of the highest peaks stays very dry. Fires like this one, controlled or accidental, are entirely too common. The simple beauty of so many small mountain towns is captured by this one, Aibonito. So named because when the valley was seen for the first time, someone exclaimed, ay, que bonito. Oh, how beautiful. The exclamation became the name. Less than five miles from my Bonito is a gorge in the central mountains 500 feet deep. Waters from the Rio Usabon fall in stages for that entire distance. This is Puerto Rico's Grand Canyon. On the route from San Juan in the north to Ponce in the south stands a monument dedicated to Jibaro families. Like the people it depicts, it is classically elegant in its extreme simplicity. In this part of the island, Jibaro families have been the very backbone of rural life and culture. Modern highways have made travel a good deal easier, although it's obvious that someone around here would much rather be flying. Rum drinkers are passionate about their particular brand. Often the preference is regional. Bacardi, Bacardi, is produced up in San Juan, while Don Cu, Don Q, is brewed here in the south around Ponce. And we are now in Ponce. Ponce, named after Ponce de Leon, is Puerto Rico's second largest city and prides itself on its southern gentility, even though its symbol is a ferocious leon.
We just happen to arrive in the city Ponceños call the Pearl of the South on the last day of Carnaval, the end of a week-long celebration that precedes Lent, which explains the festivities in the streets of this normally placid city. At midday, during most weeks of the year, this is the quietest, most unassuming, and welcoming of Puerto Rican towns. The architecture here is an exquisite rendering of the 19th century Spanish colonial hacienda style. The center of Ponce, as with all cities here, is the large church, the first version of which was built as a small chapel by the Spanish in the 1660s. This modern cathedral dates only from 1931. La Plaza Las Delicias, the Plaza of Delights alongside the church is aptly named. Tall shade trees cool those who choose to linger, while intriguing craft shops, cafes, and restaurants grace the surrounding streets. This fountain of the lions is not from Ponce at all. It was rescued from, of all places, the 1939 New York World's Fair. Carnival week, however, is the period when the plaza is most delightful and delicious. Elaborate paper mache masks, a folk art for which the city is renowned, worn by Ponces's De Gigantes, the mischief makers, create a devilishly colorful atmosphere during Carnaval. plays on so late into the night, it's amazing to see all these people on the streets the next morning. But even if terribly hungover, no one in Ponce would ever miss the big parade. The barrios or neighborhoods compete with their own decorated floats, marching bands, and grotesque gangs of homegrown vejigantes. Overlooking the city on Vigia Hill are two very different and contrasting monuments. The first is Castello Serrayes, an enormous Moorish-style castle, now a museum, that Senor Serrayes, a rich sugar baron and founder of Don Q. Rum, built in the 1930s. Cruceta El Vigia is an immense cross built on the same spot where Spanish lookouts searched for seagoing smugglers. You may either climb the steps to the top or take the elevator. Once there, however, the view from this remarkable place will especially, at the end of the day, take your breath away. Because each evening, the setting sun paints another masterpiece. Thank you.
Amidst the Cordillera Central, close to the geographical center of the island, is Serra Puntas, the top of Puerto Rico at almost 4,500 feet. From here, everywhere else on the island is downhill. Guanica itself isn't especially impressive as coastal towns go, but the 9,200-acre national forest that surrounds it really is. It is designated a United Nations Biosphere Reserve. Towering desert cacti are among the 700 species of plants. 100 varieties of birds have settled here as well. Just offshore are mangrove islands. This one is called Gilligan's Island, just for the fun of it. Its only permanent inhabitants are some very elusive manatees. The Cabo Rojo Lighthouse tells us once again that we are turning a corner of the island and heading up the far western coastline. Ironically, palm trees which we so naturally associate with Puerto Rico are not indigenous to the island. Many were brought here in centuries past from the Canary Islands. Named after an old Taino chieftain whose name means place of the great waters, Mayagüez, once a great tuna fishing port, is still by far the largest city on the west coast. The excellent math and science campus of the University of Puerto Rico, Racinto Universitario Mayagüez, is known familiarly by its acronym, R-U-M, RUM. Once again, the central square is, of course, called Plaza Colón. In general, the beaches on the west coast, because they are so distant from the island's more accessible resorts, are really for aficionados of solitude and simplicity.
The surf of Rincón, which means corner in Spanish, has drawn international wave seekers ever since it hosted the World Surfing Championships in 1968. Decades later, the surfing is every bit as good as it's always been. Although up around the Rincón Lighthouse, where we turn the last major corner of the island, the surf is considerably rougher than anywhere else. It should come as no surprise that each town on this portion of the island claims to be the place where Columbus first came ashore, and has even built replicas of his ships to prove it. Most scholars, however, believe it was very near here, in Aguadilla. This city too claims Cristóbal Colón. Arecibo is, more importantly, the gateway inland to the Parque de las Cavernas del Río Camuy. These strange-looking outcroppings contain one of the world's largest cave networks and the third longest underground river in the world. If spelunkers, cave explorers, can be said to have a heaven, it really might be this hole in the ground. In the movie Contact, which was filmed at the Observatorio, an extraterrestrial message was received here. In the real world, scientists are waiting at this, the world's largest radar radio telescope, for just such a first contact. Archaeological signs of the pre-Columbian Taino presence are everywhere on the island. These circles along the northern coastline are believed to be the site of a now lost tribal ritual. Wave patterns at the picturesque beach known as the seashell break and spread in perfect arcs. You can watch them hypnotically for hours.
Heading back towards San Juan once again, we come to Dorado and the prime beachfront property developed by Lawrence Rockefeller in the mid-1950s. The old Rockefeller place isn't quite what it was in its golden age. New wealth has made Dorado a fashionable place once again, as you can tell by the latest generation of dream homes. Not one or two, but six golf courses give every type of player the same chance to spoil what could have been a very enjoyable afternoon walk. Evening settles slowly and softly over Viejo San Juan. The city's already heavy traffic builds almost to chaos. The people returning to their homes after a busy day, while others might be coming back into town for a late meal, a visit to the casino, or to a salsa or reggaeton club.
It is wonderful to take a quiet stroll in the cool, refreshing night air. For visitors who have almost run out of time, it is the hour to return again to the cruise ship. If you want to be up early in the morning to see the ship leave the harbor and sail past those familiar walls and the old fort, it's probably a good idea not to get to bed too late. And it will be hard, it always is for me, not to become too sentimental about having to leave again. Mm -hmm.